yeah, thank you. Thank you again for the little introduction. And we at Science and Dialogue obviously um, don't develop one tool for um, for tackling the infodemic so as much as just thinking about what have we learned from the pandemic in science communication and what, what can we learn from there going, going further. And a lot of the things uh, Christine has touched on are actually in our thoughts as well. But I thought what I would do today is give you a short insight into Germany and the pandemic, German psychom and the pandemic, and what we derive from it concerning uh, misinformation, the infodemic and disinformation as well. And with a special focus on, um, on target groups, because I, I always believe that's a very interesting thing. Who can we actually reach? So Germany and the pandemic, we were a bit lucky with the first wave in Germany. It hit us a bit later than the rest of you, than a lot of other European countries. And we do have a quite well-funded, quite well-functioning healthcare system as such, with a strong regional focus, which allowed us uh, for, um, which allowed German hospitals to act as local hotspots and kind of contain the pandemic a bit more in local spots. And thus we um, were less affected by the uh, pandemic, and especially the first wave, when you look at death rates as the parameter. Um, still, the pandemic hit Germany's economy pretty hard and our daily lives obviously changed. And um, what we saw in the beginning, especially, was that the German government has relied heavily on scientific expertise and worked closely with both institutions and individual researchers to um, get a handle on and get a grip on the pandemic. But that has changed slightly. And what we're going to do, what we're going to see later on is that there are different various stages where the pandemic and the communication around the pandemic has changed. Um, the acceptance for measures within the general pub public remained high throughout the crisis. They were a lot higher in the beginning than they are now, but they still very high. And even though the uh, measurements got stronger and stricter, we still remained to have a relatively high acceptance for them. And the similar situation we find when it comes to trust in science, which is one of the important things that Christine's mentioned, and I'm very glad you did. And when we look at um, how much German people um, trust science and research, we can actually see that it changed to the positive during the early stages in the pandemic. So we have the dates from 2017, 2018 and 2019 because we do a, a, a yearly science bar barometer and then we decided to do in the pandemic to do three more of those par um, um, barometers just to see how it changes. And what you can see there is that especially in April 2020 during the first wave there was a very high trust all of a sudden in science and research. And I mean, the rise from trusting completely from 9% to 36% is, is massive. And we then also saw that it, it dropped slightly in the after studies, but it still remained, remained higher than trust was before the pandemic. And that's an interesting thing to see, especially considering that the feeling a lot of people have is that skeptics are on the rise and then we see a lot of people criticizing uh, measurements and so the data doesn't actually show that and i'm going to come to that later and what that means for us as science communicators um so i've divided the pandemic in four acts of communication in germany and um the one of that is a scientist as a leader so our chancellor is a, a trained scientist and in the early phases of the pandemic that was lauded and applauded by international research, uh, uh, media stations because she tackled the problem as a scientist would. And she herself became a very, very good science communicator because she was making an effort of explaining details about the spread of the virus to the general public in press conferences, in, out, in other outlets. So, the belief was that she had a firm grasp about the pandemic, she had a firm grasp about the science behind it, and she could actually handle the pandemic better than other leaders who had no relation to science at all. That heavily changed during the pandemic because she became a lot quieter. So while she was very prominent in the beginning, um, the regional leaders in Germany took over as the pandemic progressed, and loads of them 
took a very different approach and um, we can see that in various things and one of the things where we could really see that come to place and where that really happened was um, the issue of the Heinsberg protocols as we call it um, which is this is a bit of a uh, worst worst practice example for science communication I think and surrounds the two gentlemen you can see in the middle picture Armin Laschet who is the um, regional leader for North Rhine-Westphalia of the CDU and Henrik Strieck, who is a HIV scientist, who has been one of the most prominent uh, scientists speaking about the COVID pandemic, though not really doing or having previously re researched this type of virus. And he's someone who's very much sees himself as a political advisor, or at least in the beginning of the pandemic, took over that role. And what he did with the Heinsberg Protocol, he got a PR company that did all the communication for the happening. And Heinsberg was one of the super spreader events in Germany. And he did research there and trying to figure out how people got infected and how the virus spreads. Um, but the research was used by Armin Laschet and his uh, party and the government and the local government to advocate for opening up stuff at a very early stage. And so what happened was Strick kind of provided the arguments for Armin Laschet to open up places long before the scientific community had actually discussed the results of his study. And later on, it was shown that the study doesn't really depict the things that we took from them and that were made of them to reason for opening up spaces. So that's a, um, a very negative example about how politics and science tried to work together, but didn't really manage to work together in a beneficial way for any side. Um, but just to, and scientists were used at that stage to, um, to kind of promote messages and to promote um, what, what uh, politicians thought was the right way. And each politician almost picked out their individual scientists that they wanted to believe. So from Merkel being a scientist as a leader in control, in charge, it went over to regional things and to scientists being picked out by different um, politicians depending on, on their narrative and what were, they were saying. Um, we then saw the other very prominent scientist of the corona pandemic uh, is Christian Drosten, who's our main um, virolog virologist who worked with um, the type of virus for years and who's actually um, worked with SARS viruses before. So he was very prominent and he has a podcast where he regularly and in a very brilliant way educates people about the virus and the meaning of the research behind it. But he, because there were other researchers speaking out and having voicing different opinions and um, interpreting their early stage scientific research at a different rate, he got under pressure. And he had a study that, um, that suggested that kids were as infectious as adults. And um, that's one of the main reasons why they closed schools in Germany and kindergartens. And the Bild Zeitung, which is um, the equivalent of uh, a tab, the worst kind of tabloid you can imagine uh, in Germany. And they tried to use that against him and try to create the narrative that he's not a good scientist and that his results are faulty and that he's all, he's with the government in the same boat and just wants to close Germany down and bring it under lockdown. And he, who is a um, very outspoken uh, communicator and who's very good at communicating methods, values and processes of science, as well as the results, um, turned against that paper and said, I have better things to do than dealing with you. And that kind of created an atmosphere of distrust between media stations or certain media stations and Christian Drosten and scientists who were in his group. And so this kind of next scandal that happened um, in a way resulted in a, diff in a shift in media attention and in the uh, shift that uh, tabloid magazines or more right-wing media in Germany now create a narrative where Christian Drosten is a liar and uh, not to be believed, which is a huge problem considering that some people only read those news. Um, 
And then we're seeing conspiracy myths. Um, we're seeing that people are openly against the measures. We have weekly demonstrations here in Germany. Um, and we see that they're becoming louder and more recognized in the coverage of the issues. So we're not seeing that they are more than they were before, but we're seeing they're becoming more outspoken and the media covers that what they do a lot more than it used to before. Um, the, and also another thing that we see is that those groups opposing the measures are often melted together into one big group under the somewhat misleading term controversial thinkers in the public's eye. And I mean, it's not controversial what they think, it's wrong. And especially if it's about um, the conspiracy myths they spread. Um, and we see that the media coverage of those is much higher and it leads to the impression that there are more and more people um, against it, which is a problem because you can, can see like, if there's a lot of people having that opinion, other people may think they can jump the bandwagon and go on there and try to get the same opinion and, and just walk along them. And especially vulnerable groups have a problem with it. And we are having and seeing a more consistent uh, rise of pseudoscientists who are actually pretending to be knowledgeable about virology, even though they're not, and public figures speaking out against uh, the German government and about the health measures. And that is another ultimate problem in the a verge of conspiracy myths. This is backed up by data. We actually do see more trust, but we also see a very high level of people that are actually thinking um, that it's not really, um, that there, there's no real proof, for example, and stuff like that still, is still around and still goes around. And um, so what we thought was, okay, so, so who's actually most vulnerable for conspiracy myths? Because we, the belief is you cannot, uh, try to reach everyone with one project. And I think that's also along the lines with uh, what Christine pointed out, that you have to be to target specific audience. And so what we're now focusing on is reaching the undecided, which is in the data I, I showed before about trust, the undecided are a group that is about 20% of the population and it used to be much higher in non-pandemic times. And we believe that this group is the most vulnerable to conspiracy myths because they are not yet highly skeptical of science, but they are not sure what to trust and what not to trust. And thus, we think this is really the group where science communication can make an effort. Or whereas like with real skeptics, it's very hard to, and I'm sure everyone has this experience, it's very hard to actually reach them and get through to them. You should still try, but we as science communicators, uh, thought it was a beneficial way to target those who are very vulnerable to conspiracy myths, but can still be impacted. And um, to do so, I think it needs a multi-level and multi-outlet approach. I think it's very important to realize and know that conspiracy myths are not only spread through social media, but that's just one part of it. And that especially in the under, undecided group, which is a, usually a bit of an older age group, we see that a lot of people use regional newspapers at the, as their main um, news source. And that's a very interesting thing to keep in mind when coming up with measures against uh, the infodemic. Um, we do believe a strong focus on communicating methods, processes, and values of science is important. That was clearly shown by the media scandals we had because people just didn't know what to believe anymore because they didn't know how the science works and they didn't know how to judge a peer reviewed paper over a preliminary result uh, that is published. Um, so we advocate for different outlets that actually focus on communicating methods, prices and values of science as well to create more trust. And the ultimate game is to, uh, to create informed trust. So we don't want blind trust. We want people to, um, to be able to make decisions about um, trust themselves. And therefore we need to implement it in the early stages and in educational uh, stages. We also found that um, within the group, the interactions between scientists and publics are very low. So they don't even know scientists. So they, they've never been in touch. And thus um, we think creating those spaces for interactions online and offline will, will be another thing we need to foster. And then um, I'm coming to the end in a minute. Um, 
I think we also need to foster a dialogue within our societies, how we want to have constructive dialogue in social media, which might mean we need regulations and stuff like that. I think that's another very important thing that science communication can actually contribute to. And we need to support our scientists. The case of Christa Dawson and many other scientists who have received death threats um, from right-wing media or uh, right-wing people is a terrible thing to see and I think we need to find ways to support them and to kind of create rooms where they can feel safe and furthermore and that's also very important we need to stop this thing where we have a false balance in the media where uh, conspiracy misspreaders are over represented because I think that is really harmful for people that feel vulnerable because they think yeah okay if everyone is of that opinion that must be correct and if there's so many people against it there has to be some truth behind it. um so yeah thank you for your attention and i hope that was insightful though it wasn't really presenting the one thing we do against uh uh conspiracy myths, but just a bit of an overview of what has been done in germany and what we've learned from it from a science communication perspective thank you so much rebecca i think it's very recognizable i think many of the the elements you brought up uh, there were very similar processes in uh i think all our countries across europe and yeah. and um uh, i definitely share your opinion i think all of us do uh, on the point that you mentioned that we need to protect our scientists and i think uh, in many countries also in belgium um uh, our scientists are receiving death threats and that's a um a bit of a concern i would say um also i, I thought it was a bit of a message of hope as well saying that trust <laughs> has not decreased that much and it's more it seems like um, or, or what do you think is, what, what would be your perspective? Do you feel like um, the, the strongest voices are the one that are most diverging on the scale uh, of how people feel? Uh, could you share your thoughts on that? And then we will take, there's two questions in the chat. We will try to quickly take them and then we'll go to the next speaker. Thank you, over to you, Rebecca. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's the interesting, I think that is the message of hope, yes. <laughs> I, I find those results very, hopeful and I th I think it's a good thing that so many people do trust in science and it's actually good um I however think that it is becoming stronger on the edges so we have a bit of a growth within skeptics as well and we are seeing in general as a society and I'm that's true for most European countries that we see a polarization and that we feel that the elites are um, detached from the rest of the society. And I always have the fear that science, which is an elitist system in a way, or not only in a way, it is an elitist system, <laughs> um, might become more vulnerable to it. It's not there yet, but we have to take action now to kind of remain strong on that, those levels and to, to not, it's not about creating more trust, it's about stabilizing that trust, because I think there is a fear of it going down in years to come, especially right. what, which, what we're seeing about min misinformation. Okay, thank you. There's a lot of very interesting uh, questions in the chat. I will take only one because we're running out of time. Uh, but we know what's been quite unique in Germany is that there's an anti-misinformation legislation. Um, ha do you think it had any significant effect on disinformation flows? Uh, yeah, not really. <laughs> I think it didn't. I mean, yeah, I mean, um, I mean, yes, of course, of course, it has a positive effect. And I think it's a good thing that we have it. But I don't think that it works well enough yet. I think the measures we have are too light. And we don't not, not meaning that I want to regulate everything. But I think we need to. I think the problem is that it spreads so fast and it opens up on so diff so many different stages that we can't contain it. Um, with our measures because they are put in place and then they work and then you forbid this or you work against that level yeah and another one spreads so i think that's the main problem i think that's why thank you yeah, why it's 